It is my honor and privilege to be here. Uh, for all uh, those who are present, uh, I welcome all of you on behalf of O and uh, uh, a brief introduction on what this whole thing is about and why we are all gathered here today. So exactly to this date, a year ago, O was set up and it was set up to build bridges. It wasn't uh, just a matter of identifying gaps. We know the gaps are there. We also know that the gaps are widening. So it is a matter of addressing these gaps and committing to working towards building bridges. The discussion of decolonizing curriculum isn't new. Um, in the pre-colonial India, art and science subjects weren't disconnected. However, in post-colonial India, they are taught to students as two disconnected disciplines. That separation is an outcome of colonization. Decolonizing academia would in that case be the marrying of art and science subjects and not in the scant inclusion of English writers, including William Shakespeare in English language teaching. The West's limited understanding of the East and the tendency to often assume a moral high ground uh, in the academic realm to the point of academic imperialism is definitely a cause of concern. It is in all interest to overcome these barriers in learning and to evolve a level playing field for all. At O, we emphasize on verse, we begin with young learners. Now, maybe it might have struck a lot of you, why O? The O factor. O factor is our muse letter. Uh, O's universality, uh, versatility uh, is highly alluring. It not only holds the sound O, the numeral O, and the shape O within it, but also its implications in each of the three forms uh, that are furthermore diverse and uh, quite in correlation. The oral O, the mathematical O, and the shape O converge in verse where art and science complement each other and fuse to become one single entity. The same O in numerous ways can bridge the East-West divide too. That's what we feel. We have uh, with us Sir Stanley Wells, honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, general editor of Penguin and Oxford Shakespeare's, us, Dr. Paul Edmondson, Head of Research at Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and also a priest in the Church of England, uh, to lead a session on Shakespeare's sonnets based on their groundbreaking work published by the Cambridge Press titled All the Sonnets of Shakespeare. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is Sarah Jacob. Uh, well, as I stand here, uh, rather sit here <laughs> to welcome all the wonderful people who are here with us today for this lecture. I'm really trying to hide my grin as I think about this privilege I have got to welcome you all. Um, first and foremost, I would like to welcome the guest speaker of the day, Professor Sir Stanley Wells, one of the world's foremost authorities on Shakespeare, I'd say. It's a pleasure to have you with us, sir, and we wholeheartedly welcome you. I would also like to welcome Dr. Paul Edmondson, head of the research at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Overwhelming indeed it is to have this opportunity to welcome you to today's lecture. And uh, at this point, may I also welcome our trustees who are with us, uh, who are always, you know, you always have uh, our backs, our, your backbone and support. And of course, our team that looks at challenges as opportunities. I would also like to welcome all the staff and students from universities, colleges, and schools across the country and around the world. So once again, um, welcome one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for that, that lovely introduction and setting the context for your first anniversary and building bridges over gaps. Um, thank you for calling all the sonnets of Shakespeare published by Cambridge University Press a groundbreaking book. Um, we're going to have a conversation between us about it by way of introducing the book and telling you a little bit more about it and, and what we hope we've achieved. 
and then we look forward to a question period. Thank you. So, um, Stanley, where where did this book start from for you? Well, I suppose in a way it starts with our earlier book on the sonnets. We wrote a book published by Oxford University Press in 2004 called Shakespeare's Sonnets. It's a study of the sonnets. It's not an edition, doesn't reprint the sonnets, but it discusses various aspects of them, like their early printing, their reception, uh, the prosody, the, the, the various technical things to do with the sonnets. And in writing that book, we, we felt very strongly that these have been much misunderstood poems, that they've been misunderstood partly because of the legend created in the late 18th century by the great scholar Edmund Malone, who created, uh, who said that the first 124 are addressed to a boy or a young man and the remainder to a dark lady. That is a myth that has, per that has been perpetuated and still goes on being perpetuated even in quite authoritative sources, such as, for example, the British Library website or the Norton, uh, the introduction to the Norton edition of Shakespeare. Do you want to take over from there, Paul? Yes, just a little bit. Um, we, th we thought we would try and break some of these misunderstandings back in 2004. And we, ha we still believe that our 2004 book does that. But as, as times moved on, um, we still kept coming across critical misreadings of the sonnets. And we thought, you know, what else could we do? And another organisation, institution that we're both very much joined to is the Shakespeare Institute, University of Birmingham. And about four years ago, we were co-leading a class on the sonnets for a group of MA students there, for our friend Professor Ewan Fernie. And Stanley was talking about Shakespeare's personality in relation to some of the sonnets. And I was talking about writing sonnets. And somehow or other, our conversation moved into, oh, but Stanley, there are also sonnets embedded within the plays. For example, when Romeo and Juliet first meet, they, they share the speaking of a sonnet. Love at first sight, and they speak a sonnet. Um, a sonnet introduces the play, doesn't it? Romeo and Juliet. The chorus. The chorus. And there are other sonnets through, through the work. And then at one moment in this conversation, I looked out to the class and said, Stanley, I wonder if anyone has ever, as it were, imported all of Shakespeare's other sonnets and put them among the 1609 sonnets and, as far as we can, in chronological order. And that was the beginning of the book. That was, as it were, as we say, the penny drop moment. Um, and we left that class and we just sort of went away and did it. And we put this proposal together and Cambridge University Press accepted the proposal. And we call the book All the Sonnets of Shakespeare because it's the first time that anyone's ever done this with, as it were, Shakespeare's, let's call it complete sonnet output. And we can negotiate carefully about how we included and what we didn't include. But, but in, 15, in 1609, there were published 154 sonnets. Yeah. Our book has 182 sonnets in, in it. And, and, they, and it purports to be um, a chronological ordering um, of those poems. So, I mean, Stanley, how did we work out the chronological ordering? Well, this wasn't, w w wasn't easy. You see, the, the, the 69 edition uh, prints the sonnets with a, a clear division uh, Malone was right in that respect, that the, the, all those that are addressed to um, a, 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 a male person are in... Are, the, with, are within the first 126 yeah. sonnets. And all those that are definitely addressed to a female subject are after 127 to 154. So there is a definite break. But every, every edition of the sonnets, in, even in, in, in translation and in the original language of English, every edition other, uh, up to now has printed them in the order in which they appeared in 1609. Uh, it's, it's an interesting order, and there are groups within that 
ordering, such as the, uh, the sonnets, for example, concerned with a rival poet, they, they come together. There are links between some of the sonnets, grammatical links between some, some of them, which make a little subdivision of them. But uh, they're not printed in 1609 in the order in which Shakespeare wrote them. There, there's no doubt whatever about that. Uh, shall we explain what they, they yeah, the, for example, uh, one of them uh, was pr pr pointed out in only as recently as 1971. Andrew Gurr, the great theatre historian, uh, pointed out that... Uh, 145. One is, uh, is, ...is addressed to Anne Hathaway because it has a pun in, in, in the final couplet uh, on, on, on her name. And, and, and Andrew Gurr uh, supposed, therefore, it was an early poem... And he, he could suppose this quite plausibly because it's in, it's in iambic tetrameter, not pentameter, and it feels um, a much younger poem. A slighter poem, isn't it? Than, 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 than the, the others in the, the collection. Others, yeah. Well, if that's not printed until 145 in the collection, that sort of throws open the chronology of the whole collection. Yeah. And in any case, um, scholars for at least the last 30 years have understood that the order in which they're printed is not the order in which they were written. Yeah. And here we must refer and defer yeah. to the excellent Macdonald P. Jackson from um, New or Auckland University, New Zealand. And he has worked for many years on the chronological, the chronology of the sonnet. It's a sty stylistic, um, stylometric analyses of Shakespeare's sonnets. And back in 2002, um, Professor Mac Macdonald P. Jackson came up with a theory about dividing the collection and understanding that the actually the later sonnets published, printed in the collection, are among the earliest written. And, 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 and he sliced up uh, the collection into purported, as it were, slices of chronological arrangement, which you can then rearrange like a jigsaw puzzle and, and think very differently about the ordering. So we absolutely used Macdonald P. Jackson's scholarship for, for the for the for the most part the of most what part, we've done, yeah. but we threw in um, an idea of our own. Standing. Yes, we have one or two ideas of our own. Uh, particularly, the two sonnets which are printed last in the sixteen hundred and nine volume are, it has recently been observed, translations. They're, they're not original poems by Shakespeare. They're translations from a Greek epigram. Uh, by, a, by somebody called Marianus Scholasticus. They're entirely untypical of the other poems in the collection. And uh, we thought, well, why would Shakespeare be translating, not writing original poems, why would he be translating at any point in his life, uh, except possibly at school? And so we thought, well, possibly these are his earliest poems, poems written uh, under the guidance of a schoolmaster, particularly because one of them revises the other. Um, the, the last printed uh, vol in, in the volume 154 is uh, the, the earlier version, uh, and 153 printed before it is in fact clearly a revision of that. So we took the rather bold step we, 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 of introducing our volume, of beginning our volume with these two poems. We then uh, chronologically uh, print the Anne Hathaway poem, which uh, on the basis that it's a wooing poem, would have been written uh, in, in 50, the early 1580s, 1582, yeah. in 1582 probably, when Shakespeare was 18, wooing Anne Hathaway. Uh, so that's one of the uh, original features of our book. And then beyond that, uh, we, we also go on to, to rearrange them in what we believe to be the chronological order 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 based on, on on Jackson's scholarship and intersperse those with so sonnets and the plays across Shakespeare's career. Now, what does this show us immediately is that our book um, puts over very clearly that Shakespeare was writing sonnets at least over 30 years, which is a large part of his career, which means that this particular poetic form is incredibly important to Shakespeare. And if he's, if he's writing them as early as the early 1580s or even before then as a, as a, as a, as a um, translation exercise. Up until when? Up until Cymbeline? Up until Henry VIII, All is True, in collaboration with John Fletcher? That's the span of his career, this form, 
he can't leave alone. And, and he publishes 154 of them in 1609. There are three unattributed sonnets about Venus and Adonis in a book called The Passionate Pilgrim, which was published in 1599. Um, and they could be by Shakespeare, so they find their way into our volume, The Appropriate Point. And then we find sonnets in um, The Two Gentlemen of Verona and Henry V and All's Well That Ends Well and Romeo and Juliet and um, Much Ado About Nothing. And you suddenly start to realise, my goodness, there was something about this form yes. which he engaged with differently on many an occasion and especially when you look at the difference, for example, between the 1609 sonnets and the way he's using the form embedded within the drama, that, is, that also is, is very revealing and tells us what, for example, that usually in um, a play when a character speaks a sonnet, and indeed when Romeo and Juliet share a sonnet, within a monologue or dialogue, it's about the inner life. It's about almost like a moment of dramatic spotlight onto the character. And we find something out about him or about her. And that's why uh, a couple, at least two of the sonnets in the plays are, 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 are epistles, are in letter form. Um, in All's Well It Ends Well, um, Helen writes, to, writes uh, a letter to the Countess in the form of a sonnet. Valentine... Uh, writes a letter to, to Sylvia um, in the form of a sonnet. In the two gentlemen, the of, two Verona. gentlemen of Verona. Um, and, and, and all, sorry, Karen. I was going to say there are also the more formal ones, the rhetorical ones, where Shakespeare uses the, the sonnet form to introduce a play, <laughs> as he does with Romeo and Juliet, two choruses to Romeo and Juliet, written uh, in, in this form. In Henry V, the, there is a sonnet form. We also were very uh, um, conscious in our in our edition to identify the gender of the addressee when we could be clear about it. So what we find that far from the first 126 all being to a male subject, that's what we we we, we haven't believed that at all. Um, but they they contain all the ones that are addressed to a male. There's a a, a big difference in that in that understanding that. Um, 14 out of 154 are definitely addressed to a male subject and not necessarily the same male. And a further 13 might be, which takes a total of 27 out of 154. And for a female, seven are definitely addressed to a female and another two might be. Again, there's nothing to show that they're to the same female subject, which means that um, 85 sonnets could be addressed to either a male or a female, um, only 121 of the 154 are actually addressed to a person. Yeah, quite. Um, the rest are addressed to, um, seven sonnets are address addressed to abstract concepts, such as love or to time or to the muse. Um, 25 are personal meditations when it's the first person subject thinking through a situation or presenting some kind of essay in miniature and then two as Stanley said a moment ago are translations now that completely changes the complexion of how we understand Shakespeare's 1609 quarto for a start and then it's well what do you do with that and especially when you put the 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 sonnets and the plays um among among them one of the things we hope we've done is that we've set free the sonnets from the old assumptions of this tired narrative to do with an invented Shakespearean biography. What, we, what we've now got on our, our, our table, as far as the sonnets are concerned, is, is much more like um, uh, anthology. A, an anthology of poems written over time in which Shakespeare's personality shines through very differently and, uh, and for different purposes, rather than that being somehow lost and diminished in our understanding through a layered on narrative. So we hope we've done some good uh, in, in this, uh, as it were, uncoupling. But um, to use the word couple, just, just as I have, reminds me that um, none, of the, none of the mini sequences within the collection have been separated or broken up by the chronological reordering. They've all stayed together, whether that's to do with procreation or seasons or 
uh, meditations on time. Or the there, so-called rival poet. Or the so-called rival yeah, poet. Yeah. And also, um, we've, we've shone a torch clearly on 19 pairs of sonnets within the 154, which haven't properly been noticed before, not in quite this way, which means that on, on 19 occasions, Shakespeare wrote a sequel to a sonnet, um, and those pairs have stayed together in the chronological rearranging. Two of them, for example, are written, as it were, on horseback. Two of the sonnets are, are, uh, recount Shakespeare's journey. Actually written from the point of view of someone being on a horse being, being riding, on, being on a horse. Um, which when you think about his commuting between London and Stratford becomes especially interesting because on in the first sonnet, number 50, he's going away from his beloved on the, and, and in, the, in the next sonnet, the, the, the sequel, he's, go, he's going back to, to his beloved. Um, so it, it, it's full of of revelations of that kind, and we, we've also done we also did some speculation about whether any of the sonnets could be related to any of the characters in the plays, didn't we? Yes, we did. Uh, we don't want to be too emphatic about this. We so. don't want to be too emphatic about it because we don't want to give the impression that we think that Shakespeare was writing sonnets as sort of exercises for speeches in plays. Because on the whole, we do believe very firmly that these are Shakespeare's personal poems. Some critics uh, almost evade the personal implications of these poems by saying that perhaps Shakespeare was just in putting himself into an imaginary situation, such as uh, a character in a play might feel. On the contrary, we feel that these are Shakespeare's deeply personal poems, some more deeply personal than others. Some of them are meditations. For example, they include his only overtly religious poem, number 146, 146. Uh, Poor Soul, the Centre of My Sinful Earth, the one that's slightly damaged. The second line uh, repeats uh, two words from the, the first line. Uh, the, 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 uh, and, two, and one or two of the poems are letters, epistles. One begins, Lord of my love. Um, Lord of my life. What does Lord mean there exactly? We ask ourselves. That's number 20, twenty-six, and the other the other epistolary sonnet is seventy-seven, which seems to have been a sonnet which accompanied a gift to to the addressee. Um, so it's it's there's a real variety, yeah, which variety is, is which, which emerges from our our project. Yeah. A variety of subject matter and also a great variety of style. Some of the sonnets are much easier to understand than others. So that, for example, if we were using these for teaching, we would not begin um, for, for younger students with some of the more difficult poems, but we'd begin with some of the more straightforward, perhaps some of the more lyrical ones, such as number 18, for example. Uh, Which is, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? The, 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 these are among the more popular poems. Some of them are, are, are very difficult metaphysical poems. So, and they're they're very um, very mixed moods. I mean, it's you know we 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 are only half joking when we say these these are really not poems of Valentine's Day, um, because you know there's a lot of anguish and jealousy and self loathing um, in Shakespeare's sonnets, and. You can open the collection at random, and the chances are you'll find a, a poem that you, you don't immediately like. Um, and uh, Michael Dobson um, hinted at this in his his short introduction uh, to this talk on, on social media, and basically said these are thought poems, most of them. They're thought puzzles, they're difficult, they're abstractions. Um, but it's, it, it's very, very mixed this this collection from 1609 yeah. and you, you can't really say anything as William Empson um, said to Ingestina Eubank many years ago on such a subject as Shakespeare's sonnets it's impossible to say anything either tidy or complete which is which is a great phrase I remember hearing Professor Eubank say that at the Shakespeare Institute yes, yes. Uh, many years ago now, Stanley. Should we say something about the original publication uh, for the benefit of people who don't know the full details about it? That the This, this is an important point in yeah. terms of um, how we think about Shakespeare's perhaps personality in relation to the poems. Yeah. You see, um, the, and it's, it's, it's important because why? It's important because when the sonnets first appeared in 1609, they appeared not as 
a book published by Shakespeare, but as a book published by a man called Thomas Thorpe, who is the, the publisher and the printer of the volume. And the title page says Shakespeare's Sonnets. It's what you quite call a, a third person title. It isn't sonnets by William Shakespeare, as you might have King Lear by William Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare's sonnets, a third person, meaning that they're, 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 they've been put together by, by the publisher. Similarly, the dedication. Normally, when a volume was published, it was the author of the work who dedicated it to a, a patron or a friend or whatever. In this case, it's the publisher, Thomas Thorpe, who writes the dedication to Mr. W.H., a mysterious Mr. W.H. We don't know who Mr. W.H. is. We have no real strong theories about that, have we? Mr., of course, is master in Shakespearean terms. There have been many conjectures. It might be William Herbert or, uh, or, or even ridiculous. I think Henry Ridsley, the initial was reversed. Uh, but so uh, there is a mystery about the publication. I believe firmly, however, that Shakespeare put the sonnets in, in that were in the in, he ordered them in the order in which they are published in the 1609 volume. Uh, so, so, so the the idea there is that somehow the publisher. If these, the, if if we're saying that a lot of these sonnets are really close to Shakespeare's self and private poems, some of them, some of them read very as if they're not for other eyes apart from either his own or for the purported addressee, that he's put them into an an ordering as a a, a particular order as a as a poet written over time has collected his his poems together. Somebody's obtained that manuscript sent it to a scribe, made fair copy and taken it to the printer. So so we're, we, we are of the view, because of the, some of these seem private poems, that Shakespeare didn't want them to be published. Yeah. Um, and this is what Michael Dobson also hinted at when he said that, you know, it wasn't a success, the, the, the book called Shakespeare's Sonnets. Um, didn't it, reprint. Didn't reprint because they were difficult poems. They were, they were almost too private for people to properly engage with. You contrast that with the narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, uh, the Rape of Lucrece, Venus and Adonis reprinted, I think it's 13 times in Shakespeare's lifetime, far more frequent than any of the plays did. And also his sonnets were published 10 years at least after the fashion for sonnets had, yeah, had, had sort of died yeah, out. Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was never going to be a success fashionably from that point of view. Therefore, it was his name that was selling the book, Shakespeare's Sonnets, yeah. that, oh, you're bound to be interested in this, aren't you? Um, but I think people perhaps on the whole you know, didn't like them very much. It wasn't reprinted um, in, um, in his lifetime, at least. Well, no. um, so, I mean, one can speculate further um, I'm happy to do so about Mr. W. H., but maybe now is not the time. So that's a little bit about what we have done, where it came from, and what we hope we've achieved in some of what we've done. Um, we include a, a prose paraphrase of yeah. every single sonnet, yes, um, was, which, was not, which was not easy to do. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not just a reprint, you see. We have a, a, a fairly lengthy introduction in which we discuss uh, scholarly matters connected with the sonnets. We give notes to each sonnet, explanatory notes. Uh, uh, we uh, give little thumb, what we call thumbnail sketches, which we hope uh, are helpful to a reader, just to give the reader the gist of what the meaning of the sonnet is. Uh, it, somebody, it, it, somebody, our friend Greg Doran, who's the artistic director of the RSC, Royal Shakespeare Company, said, uh, oh, those are like, makes it like a box of chocolates because you can look at the selection card and think, oh, I think I'll have one of those. And you can see it's about time or whether it's about, you know, um, how much uh, I miss you or whatever it might be. But some of them are sweeter than others. Exactly. Or, you know. Um, but also, we were rather late in that enterprise. We thought these are really very difficult poems. Some of, some of them, some of them are more difficult than others, much more. So we thought, well, why don't we try to help the readers by paraphrasing? Paraphrasing them. So at the back of the book, we have prose paraphrases. They're not they're not ambitiously literary. They're 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 workaday. Um, we we yeah. wanted them to remain a bit clunky because we wanted to convey <clears throat> the oddness of a lot of Shakespeare's own phrasing in the sonnets. So the paraphrases are not substitutes for the sonnets, but they're attempts to help readers who might find them difficult to understand, often the often complex syntax and, and, and difficult vocabulary of some of the poems. 
You can see we're stressing all the time the variety of the collection. Aren't we? That's true, yeah. After having listened to you um, in detail, we have a lot of questions, which also uh, some of the students who joined us have sent across to Lakshmi. So I request Lakshmi Krishna Kumar, who is the life of O, to come forward and <laughs> share those questions and seek answers from the few. Such a privilege. Thank you, Lakshmi. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lakshmi, uh, uh, and um, thank you for thank you so much, uh, uh, Paul and uh, Stanley, for this um, brief introduction that you've given um, us. And um, I uh, I was so delighted to get the copy of this book. Oh, the copy, uh, that's soon, good. <laughs> yes, yes. As soon as it was out, and I couldn't wait. Um, so thank you so much for this. And um, so we have some questions that that have been submitted um, regarding the sonnets. And um, I'm going to ask you the questions and there might be um, some repetition of what you may have already covered uh, here, but um, since they are submitted and maybe we could post them separately as a question and answer session uh, also, um, I'll um, carry on with that. Right. Okay. And uh, so the first question is, um, you make it rather clear in, in the introduction that the 154 sonnets first published in 1609 are a collection of poems, not a sequence, but that uh, there are many sequences and pairs of sonnets. And the sonnets of 1590s by other writers were sequences. Um, would that make it more plausible that Shakespeare was commissioned to write these sonnets or um, what does that tell us about Shakespeare? Well, if we if we admit as our book um, presents that Shakespeare was writing these poems over a long period, that's not how you write a sequence. You know, you write a sequence much more quickly than 30 years, probably. And and so that, that alone um, presents a challenge to the, any notion that this 1609 book is a sequence. Yes, perhaps we should just give the basic information that between 1591 and 1597, 17 sequences of sonnets were published in England by writers including Sir Philip Sidney, Michael Drayton and other poets, some of them not very well known nowadays. They are sequences in the sense that they are very unified, they're most of them addressed to a particular person almost always to a woman. There's one sequence which includes poems addressed to a male person by Richard Barnfield. They're very different from the Shakespeare collection. This is why we use the word collection for Shakespeare's poets on us rather than sequence. It's sequence, of course, in the sense that one comes after the other, but it's not a sequence in the sense that one of them comes logically or necessarily or poetically, as it were, structurally. But of course, within the that. collection, as you said, there are mini sequences. There are mini sequences. There are little runs yeah. of two, three, four, five, sometimes, yeah. maybe sometimes more than that, poems. And we identify those um, in our book uh, so we, you know, we can look out for them. Uh, but, it's, but it is not about anyone thinking, oh, I'll, I'll now read Sonnets 1 to 154 as published in 1609 and get some kind of story from them. I mean, that's a no, very that's difficult a very thing to do. Very mistaken notion, yes. <laughs> There's no story there. Yes, I mean, I, I think that's what we're all uh, looking for because we don't have an answer and I think that's going to carry on for a long time. Um, yeah. so, uh, uh, they, so next, uh, I'd like to say this book, again, 182 sonnets uh, are there in this book where you've included the sonnets from the plays. Yeah. As you chronologically ordered the 154 sonnets, interspersing it with the sonnets from the plays. Um, what do we learn about the evolution of Shakespeare's writing style from the teenage Shakespeare um, who had done the exercise bit, we believe the exercise bit, to the successful and rich um, playwright Shakespeare? Well, I think that's a very difficult question. It is, yeah. It's a very, it's, it, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's in some ways it's the million dollar question and it's also the hardest question. And I, I personally find it very difficult to answer because I want to be able to say, 
oh, the later sonnets are much more difficult than the earlier sonnets. But that's not necessarily true. No. It's, it, it, it is and it isn't true. Similarly, I'd like to say, oh, they become more introverted. They become uh, more inward looking the further you go along them. That's not also true, although we'd like it to be true. So, but they, but the, the personality, as it were, the flashes of Shakespeare's personality are across the collection. And they don't appear to me to be more mature in some places than in others, Stanley. No, I agree. Uh, some of them are, are, are very, some of them are very difficult poems, and those are not necessarily the last to be written. They're difficult because they show Shakespeare, like any poet, wrestling with his inner demons. Some of them are, are poems of personal suffering in which he's working out uh, emotional and sexual problems uh, using the sonnet form to do so. It's fascinating that Shakespeare only wrote, uh, the only poems that Shakespeare wrote independently of the plays and the narrative poems are always in sonnet form. He clearly found the sonnet form, the 14 line form, which he inherited from, from uh, earlier writers, uh, a, 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 a useful vehicle for working out personal problems often, but also for much simpler reasons sometimes, lyrical poems like Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, for example, and also the sonnet epistles, the, 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 the letters that he writes. But, but, if, but if people want to, as it were, jump off the fence on this, then, then one thing we might say is that from sonnets 104 to 126 are among the hardest to understand and they are the later written. Yeah. So th there is a sort of equation there, but it's it's very difficult to be generalised about this. Yeah. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thanks for the thank tough you. question. <laughs> uh, thank <laughs> you. We, we thank the students who submitted these questions. We have, uh, I, I suppose the students, I mean, would have asked this question also because sonnets, one, sonnets 153 and 154, of which um, the, the understanding is that the, 154 could have been, uh, you know, 153 would have been written first and then 154 and um, again, you know, is it? It's the other, it's the other way around. Yes. And, and, yeah. and here, here, you know, here we also, don't we follow that? We follow the work of, an, of, of another better scholar on classical literature uh, than, than we, than either of us uh, is. Um, from the 1940s, that article, yes, in, yeah, and it's an astonishing yeah. piece, and and it's really clear when you read it why 153 is the later poem and 154 is the earlier poem, um, and 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 try I mean try reading those two poems consecutively, and try and at first blush they seem like different poems. But in fact, they're from the same source and it's the reworking of the same little miniature story. And when you start to spot similarities between them, my goodness, they make you feel dizzy in the way you're trying to sort of hold them apart and tease them apart. But before it was realised that they're uh, that they are translations. Uh, people tried to relate them to Shakespeare's yeah. personal life. They they tell the story of the god Cupid, for example, going to the bath, uh, and some people uh, interpreted that to mean Shakespeare himself suffering from a venereal disease, going to bath to in tubs. England, to yeah. the hot baths in England for a cure, which is total nonsense, and you realise it's nonsense when you realise that these are translated poems. Uh, so, um, no, because the same, the, the, there was a question related to that as to, um, uh, were made, that these errors were made by uh, critics and editors of, um, and Shakespeare scholars as well. And um, so who were unaware of the classical source. So yes. how did you arrive at, uh, you know, the classical source, if you could tell us a bit? Through the work of the scholar that Paul referred to, uh, James Hutton, we, 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 we which is not we, our own discovery. No, we, we, we mentioned it and wrote a little bit about it in our 2004 book, uh, but we didn't write about the uh, ordering of those final two. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it has, been, it has been known about, and uh, Colin Burrow in his um, 2002 Oxford, Oxford edition 
uh, also writes about Marianus Scholasticus. Um, but it does, as Stanley say, really put pay to the idea that these can in any way be uh, autobiographical yeah, poems. Yeah, yeah. Yes, truly, yeah. truly. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so we we want to talk about the uh, the young man and the dark lady narrative. So you've de you debunk that narrative. Um, I, this was covered in 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 the introduction. Uh, but could you tell us a bit more about that? Also, at what stage of your research was that um, becoming apparent and how were you negotiating with each other about it? Um, do you have yeah. a process in place, especially because this is not uh, your first collaborative work? No, no. So, so we've written about the sonnets now since 2004. And we, we tried to debunk those myths into the, in our 2004 book and since in, I don't know, maybe three articles. Several articles that we've um, and, and just more and more we looked out across Shakespeare criticism and heard other papers on the sonnets and read other books on the sonnets. And, and our message was just not, it wasn't cutting any ice with, with people's readings of the sonnets. And we thought, well, what can we next do? And it's actually, we think now it's taken a, an addition of the whole of the, of the sonnet um, corpus to, to try and break through this. Now, I think somebody said a moment, uh, earlier in this um, discussion that those stories are probably going to remain for quite some time. On, on Monday next week, I'm co-chairing a seminar on Shakespeare's sonnets for the Shakespeare Association of America. And one of the papers is about the enduring quality of those stories that we've been trying to we've been trying to debunk, uh, not in a in a in a in a way that that person hopes that they'll remain it's just basically saying well this is a fact because they they've attached themselves to the to the popular imagination in relation to these and poems. not only to the popular imagination they're repeated by reputable scholars as yeah. i say the Nor the norton edition for example uh, a very popular edition in america it's the introduction by Stephen Greenblatt, great scholar as he is, nevertheless reproduces this old, quite totally false narrative that the first 126 yeah. are all addressed to and, and You see it in, in, in editions of the sonnets as well, when the, the commentator, whoever it is, will say, oh, another sonnet dressed to the young man. And you look and you think, oh, mm, there's nothing about this poem that tells me that it's addressed to a male. I nothing think, whatsoever. I think the myth is perpetuated partly because the first 17 of the sonnets are addressed to a, a young man. The, they, they, they are addressed to a young man. They're clear there is a sort of, they are sort of mini sequence themselves. They are mini sequence. Uh, 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 in, in which the poet is uh, addressing a, a young man, probably I think an aristocratic young man, and uh, suggesting that he ought to get married. At the same time, in, in doing that, nevertheless, the poet is expressing very close affection and even love for the young man himself. So it's, even these are quite complex emotions. So because the human mind is a great kind of unifier of, 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 of difference, that um, initial sequence has kind of cast a long shadow across mm. the rest of the collection and people have thought, thought oh well, they're all addressed yeah. to this same subject they don't go on and read and, and in fact when you look closely at the terms of address as we have done you'll find that some of them are addressed to a you some of them are addressed to a thou a, 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 an, an address to male subjects yeah. uh, to a, a you or a thee um and um and in different terms so one of you know sometimes lord of my love sometimes it's sweet boy Sometimes it's my dear love, um, uh, 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 and uh, other 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 forms of address of address, which suggest different subjects, not the same person. Yeah. So so we we're very open to the um, likelihood, or rather, it seems more and more um, certain that they're addressed to several different subjects uh, over. Period of a, a long period of time, and that Shakespeare's gathered them all together and 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 ordered them. Yeah. And it's the same. It's the same with it's the same with the female subject. It's absolutely the same with the uh, the person in the story who weirdly has been called the Dark Lady, um, which is you know a, a, a critical term now that um, uh, sh you know is is being debunked. But then because it's attached itself to the popular consciousness, it's very difficult to to 
to to erase it, to change it. And I'm aware every time I mention it, I'm somehow reaffirming it, which is the last thing I want to do. Remember Virginia Woolf when she was writing about um, killing the angel in the house, which was whenever a female writer thinks she has to try and be good and domesticated, stop doing it, write something else. And she uses the phrase, throw the bottle of ink at the angel in the house. I say, throw the bottle of ink at the at the young man and the dark lady because they never they they shouldn't they shouldn't be existing in in sonic criticism anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so um, again, um, you've uh, said that you emphasize on the bisexual quality of uh, yeah. Shakespeare's sonnets and quoted um, Shakespeare's scholar Marjorie Gubb. And um, uh, what do we know about the early modern period and uh, sexual attitudes? Um, so um, just to go back to, I think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing two, two really good questions in that one question. And, and the first question I'm hearing is about Marjorie Garber and her um, exploration of bisexuality in Shakespeare's sonnets. And, 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 and Professor Garber was writing uh, more than 25 years ago when um, the uh, critical assumption about the young man and the dark lady was, 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 was still, you know, absolutely uh, seen as this is what these poems are about. Now that story, which we're trying to debunk, is a bisexual story. And that, that story comes together um, famously in Sonnet 144, which is uh, the one that begins, two loves have I, I have, 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 I have of comfort and despair. The, um, the better angel is a man right fair, the worser angel, a woman coloured ill. Those are the two subjects in one poem. That particular poem has therefore been used to somehow cast a, 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 a net or, or a set and bring a sense of unity to all 154 poems. But it's a bisexual story. And because it's the story um, uh, which has been thought to have some connections with Shakespeare's life, it's also been a weird sort of um, alibi that Shakespeare's life was not really like this. You know, he he was really heterosexual and he had a wife and children. Um, and so the, the, the fictionality of the sonnets has somehow um, put Shakespeare's life at one remove at the same time as wanting them to be personal. With the with the uncoupling of the of the ordering of the 1609 sonnets, what we found is that the the, the really personal um, uh, poems which might be about let's say triangular relationships yes. shine even more brightly than they did when as it were they were buried among the traditional story and there are there are three love triangles in in Shakespeare's sonnets um, sonnets 40 41 and 42 and um, sonnets um, 133 I think and 134 is another love triangle I don't think we should be surprised to find. Four, four, uh, it's about a love triangle. I don't think we should be surprised to find this bisexuality. It certainly is unusual to find it expressed as strongly as Shakespeare does in the sonnet beginning, Two Loves Have I of Comfort and Despair, referring to a male beloved and a female beloved. Some years ago, I published a book called Shakespeare, Sex and Love in which I discussed a lot of uh, uh, facets of, of, of sexual uh, relationships in Shakespeare's time. And of course, the most, the most famous bisexual in Shakespeare's time was the king, King James I, uh, who uh, pleaded to be allowed to express his love for the, uh, for the Duke of Buckingham. Uh, he was a married man, of course. The king was married, had, had children, Prince Henry and Princess Elizabeth. And there's a very, very touching and moving letter in which he uh, requests uh, oh, and, and does plead and beg his, uh, his, his fellow uh, solicitors, his fellow uh, uh, courtiers, uh, to allow him to express his love. For, for a man as well, and it's clearly that he's expressing a sexual love. So we shouldn't be too, all that surprised to find bisexuality in, this, in, in poems written during this period, even though we don't find it so much, in, 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 as far as I know, in, in many other poets. I mean, it, 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 I mean, Marjorie Garber, to go back to, to her endeavour, she, she was breaking new ground because she was trying to characterise bisexuality 
in literature across a, a, a long period of time. And, and her book called Vice Versa is an important book because it's about bisexuality and there are not many books about bisexuality in literature when you start to look. Um, and she alighted on, on Shakespeare's sonnets as being you know, a great example of, 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 of this um, um, uh, kind of writing. Uh, our book, I think, has, has sort of amplified um, Marjorie Garber's um, understanding and, and refreshed it and done something different with it and, 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 and certainly made it, we think, more personal to Shakespeare. Um, and I, I think more and more that, um, well, I suppose like James I, um, Shakespeare himself understood what it was to love both men and women. Simultaneously, <laughs> even. And, I, and maybe that's, maybe, I mean, then, then what do you do with that? Well, then do you say, ah, oh, well, that's why some of the sonnets are, are full of anguish. Well, and that's, that's a different, different critical conversation. In other words, our book does have strong implications for biographies of Shakespeare. It should be reflected in, in any biography, I think. Um, thank you for that. Um, now, um, you inform the readers that the methodology relies on the development of Shakespeare's vocabulary and his grammatical preferences in the sequence of his work. In such a situation, had Shakespeare been the one to have published it, wouldn't he then have revised the sonnets to his more evolved style of writing? Before I go further, you have mentioned that you don't, you yeah. cannot judge uh, if, if uh, an evolved style of writing. Um, no, I don't think he would have revised them. There's no reason to suppose that a poet uh, should want the poems uh, that he's writing now uh, to resemble the poems that, that he wrote 50 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, poets, uh, surely Wordsworth is an example, for example, uh, or, or, or T.S. Eliot, they don't uh, go back and revise poems because they've learned new techniques of poetry. They, they, they allow, they, they allow the, them, their earlier selves to be represented by the poems they wrote when they were younger. I see no reason why Shakespeare should be expected to have gone over the poems again and th thought, no, I want to rewrite that in a different way because this is how I'd write it now that I'm 40, uh, differently from when I was 30. No, so, so as I say, polishing a poem is very different from rewriting it. And I think poets do polish poems. And so therefore we can say with certainty that Shakespeare was no doubt, um, you know, revising any number of these sonnets up until their publication in 1609. We can't not say that because we have to assume that that's true. Um, but the, the, the poems and the, and the way they can be dated and have been dated by MacDonald Jackson um, is achieved because within um, particular, con there are particular concentrations of rare words that only occur at certain points in Shakespeare's career within these segments that Jackson has identified as chronological across the 1609 collection. And, and that's, that's what we've followed in order to um, uh, arrange them as we have. Um, but I, absolutely, I mean, why would you rewrite entirely yes. or bring up to date an earlier poem? Um, you'd end up with two poems and you think, yeah, well, this is yeah. the other one. In fact, in fact, there are, there are yeah, early versions yeah. of, two of the two of the sonnets, uh, 144 and 138, and we print both versions in our book. They, they, they were both published first in an earlier version in, in 1599 in The Passionate Pilgrim and then in the 1609 volume. And there, actually, they, they do illustrate Shakespeare's own, we suppose, revising hand. Unless one of them is a corruption of the other. Well, it could be a corruption. We, we can't be absolutely sure yeah. that. We well, hope that helps. Yes, it does. Um, also, um, you've talked about the sonnets that they're meant to be read out aloud. Um, uh, could you please tell us a bit about the oral quality of these sonnets? Well, I think some of them will read aloud um, better than others. And, and although um, some of the 
most beautiful and lyrical poems in the English language are among Shakespeare's sonnets. Not all of them are, they're not all equally lyrical by any means. Um, no, some of them are, we might call rhetorical yeah. rather than lyrical. They have a, they do read aloud very well, some much better than others though. Some of them are really too difficult to be understood easily at a single reading, which is why you need to read them on the page as well as, as to hear them. Some of them, I think of number 29, for example, uh, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, is a wonderful piece of rhetoric, and I love reading that one. Aloud. Hey, well, why don't you read it aloud? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sonnet uh, twenty nine. Now, this is a, this this Stanley is is the is the sonnet that sort of got you interested in Shakespeare. Isn't yes, it? this is a. I I, I I read this first when I was about seventeen years old, a schoolboy, uh, getting interested in affairs of the heart, uh, and I found it a very moving and powerful poem. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least, yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, haply I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. It's like a piece of music, isn't it? It has, it, it has its own rhythms, its own emphases, uh, its own shape. So it, 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 it's good to hear it read aloud. On the other hand, it's also perfectly good to read it silently to oneself and to take it in, I think. I, I, want, I, I also, can see why it would strike us That was a marvellous reading. And yeah. I want to appreciate how quickly Stanley read that. You know, don't hang about with Shakespeare's <laughs> sonnets. Get, you know, get, get a move on. And so they, they should last under a minute. If you're in anything between 45 seconds and a minute. Well, it varies. But the, of course, this is, is a single unit, too, which is why one is, is, uh, is impelled to, to, to take it all in almost in one breath, as it were, uh, from beginning to end. It, it has it has a marvellous structure. And that, that I mean, that sonnet that Sunny read is is um, is a little story in miniature, isn't it? You're, you, you arrive at a different um, end point than you than you began and the, and the poet is looking back on that journey that that he has presented us with and we, 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 we've gone on by um by by reading the sonnet um yeah but i mean they're, they're not all they're not all equally lyrical and yeah. you read some of them aloud and you think my goodness what what have i just read um yeah, years ago, I was doing the, I, I, well, not years ago, six years ago, I walked the Shakespeare Way, which is 146 miles, and it starts at the birthplace in Stratford-upon-Avon and ends at Shakespeare's Globe in London. And uh, my friends and I, we were walking, and every mile we stopped and read a Shakespeare sonnet. And then that was like every 20 minutes. And then every, and then we would think about it for a little while on to the next mile. And time and again, we kept saying, was he really saying that? No, really? Oh, he was. Hmm, I'm not sure about that. And and our walk was char partly characterised by by these, you know, quite similar reactions to the sonnets that we were reading. That we, we we found on the whole, most of them difficult. Some of them did not read aloud well, but then some of them did. And if you ended up, you know, the the famous twelve. Let's say there's about there's maybe more than twelve, but you know, there are some sonnets that are, are, are quite justly famous, and they they tend to be the ones that sound really good. So, for example, the, ones that get into the anthologies. Yeah, I mean, let, 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 let's just think of. I mean, what, what, what would they be? Um, sonnet number two, sonnet number twelve, sonnet 18. number fifteen, eighteen, um, sonnet uh, one hundred and sixteen, sonnet fifty-three, sonnet forty-three, sonnet twenty-nine, sonnet thirty, um, sonnet one hundred and four, sonnet seventy-three. Um, uh, sonnet 138. There's 12. They're all they're all quite famous sonnets, and they're not all lyrical. Some of them are very witty. 130 is another witty one. So so they become famous because of their their wit and their intellect. Um, but um, would you like to read 130 for us? Please? I'll read 130 for you. Um, so this one is a debunking of what we might think of as the Petrarchan tradition 
in which an unobtainable, uh, unobtainable beauty is just adored in poetic terms and appreciated as you know female subject by male poet. And Shakespeare um, turns this tradition on its head in this single poem, um, Sonnet 130. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses, damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, but well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress when she walks treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. So in other words, my mistress is far better than all of the other women put together who have lovely things said about them and the poets don't really mean it. Yeah. It's, a sense, it's a comic poem until, the very, until it becomes emphatically uh, amorous at the end. And, it, and, it, and the turning point, there's always a turning point in, in, a, in a sonnet. And there, it, and, and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sonnet that Stanley read, the turning point comes at line nine, and the sonnet I read, it comes at line um, 13. Yeah. The yeah. Volta, as it's called, technically. The, the flipping over, the yeah. moving in a different direction, and the, at the, and the end of the poem's in sight, yeah. Thank you very much for that, uh, reading the poems for us. Um, now, um, in Sonnet 138, he talks about his old age. Um, oh, yeah. My days are past the best. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and also, um, again, in the same poem, he says, wherefore say not that I'm old. And going yeah. by the chronological order, Shakespeare yeah. should still be in his early 30s. I'm worried now. Um, is, is it because the, of the shorter uh, life expectancy back then? It's tricky. It's a, it's a difficult question, this. I haven't got an easy answer to it. It, <laughs> it does seem odd that Shakespeare in his early 30s should be saying he's so much older than somebody else. And I've wondered about this exactly in the terms that you've wondered about it. Is it because people had shorter life expectancy? It's, poss it's possible. Is it because the beloved is so, the, is it because there's so much of an age difference between the lover and the beloved that it, that it seems older? I haven't got an easy answer to this, have you? No, the, the earliest version of that poem was published when Shakespeare was 35 in 1599. It was in The Passionate Pilgrim, wasn't it? Um, mm. I was wondering about this. I, I, I wonder whether he's being deliberately provocative and jokey and that his mistress is actually the person that he's referring to is a, is a lot younger than he yeah, is. And so he's therefore saying, therefore, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old in comparison to you. But then when I read the poem again, I think, well, no, this is about a relationship which seems quite long established, as if they're just used to each other. Uh, because they're existing on this kind of fiction that they both accept. When my mistress, when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, um, that she might think me some untutored youth. She might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best. Well, I mean, that, that might be a joke. Simply, I credit her false speaking tongue on both sides thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not, she is unjust? And wherefore say not I, that I am old? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age in love loves not to have years told. Therefore I lie with her, and she with me, and in our faults, by lies, we flattered be. It's a very witty poem. It's self-consciously clever, isn't it's it? Very self-consciously clever. Puddingly on lies, but it, for example. It does seem as though it's written from an older perspective than a thirty-five-year-old. So I don't know what to do with that, really. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a playful poem, very slippery poem. Yes. Um. um so um, we've we've talked about uh, the uh, what I found particularly 
interesting is that um, when in, pa in the Passionate Pilgrim number one, you included a, you've included a line um, where it was missing. Um, we, made, so, we made up our own line, you mean, yeah. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I'm thinking it, it would have been fun working on this. What was it like coming up with uh, the line and how was it? <laughs> well, we, we spotted that no one had really done that before, I think. Yeah. Can we and just explain that the, yes. the, the poem has only 13 lines as originally printed and that clearly line two, is line two has accidentally got got left out possibly in the printing house uh, and therefore uh, it's you could either print it with a gap as we do on, on, the, on the on the page itself we print it with we print a, a, a pair of square brackets with a space between them or you could make a line up and we did have the audacity to make a line up so, uh, so, how, so, the, no. so fair was the morn when the fair queen of love did seek her love whilst weeping like a child, is our line, paler for sorrow than her milk-white dove, for Adon's sake, a youngster proud and wild. Well, we, I can't remember which other versions we had, but we... Well, when I, 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 I just it. made one up. Uh, when, when, I, when I read this question this morning, I thought, well, I'll rise to the challenge. So I, 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 I made up the line, did rise from her couch by, by sunlight beguiled. Fair was the morn when the fair queen of love did rise from her couch by sunlight beguiled, paler for sorrow than her milk-white dove for Odin's sake, a youngster proud and wild. So that's another alternative hey, and an picture. An and another damaged sonnet is, is sonnet 146, Poor yeah. soul, the centre of my yeah. sinful earth. And the second line is damaged because it repeats my sinful earth at the beginning of the second line. There have been at least 140 different conjectures as to what Shakespeare might originally have written there. And you, you had a conjecture, didn't you, Stanley? Yes, I, uh, I, was I, it, I think I... Rebuke, was it? Was yours, rebuke, yes. Was yours rebuke these rebel yeah, powers? Yeah, rebuke, rebuke these, these rebel, rebel powers, powers yeah. in the array. Um, I it's, can't a great, it's a great song. It's a pity. It's a pity. It's uh, it's a damaged poem. I'm just wondering. I can't remember how we print that. Oh, yes, we have we have a little empty bracket at the beginning of the line yeah, admission, to show, to show that my sinful yeah. earth. You know, what do we say there. in the note? Um, the first edition repeats my sinful earth. Many guesses as to what Shakespeare wrote include rebuke these rebel powers, fooled by these rebel powers, spoiled by these rebel powers at the array, etc., etc. So yeah, I mean, it, it, these are these are pointers that. You know, obviously, printing that period was was in was, you know was imperfect, and, and that's, yeah. that's that's the the ongoing legacy for Shakespeare editors. They, they do it? help to suggest, don't they, that Shakespeare didn't proofread the volume himself. Yeah, that, that, which is further evidence. That's that right. Had, that he, that's right. Whereas you contrast that with um, Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, yeah, beautifully which printed. are beautifully printed. You know, someone's really read those carefully. Um, they're almost ready to go as far as a modern edition is concerned. Can we just recommend those poems? They're not. They're they're they're, they're rather neglected, I think. But Venus and Adonis, especially, is absolutely marvelous poem. Very funny, very sexy, and very moving as well. Yeah, if you don't rare. know Venus and Adonis, have a go at it. It takes about an hour and ten minutes to read aloud. Aloud. <laughs> uh, Lucrece is much longer and more difficult, and you know, made of sterner stuff. Yeah, it's got some wonderful things in it. But, 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 uh, Venus, oh, but Venus and Adonis, and Adonis. is fun. <laughs> <laughs> when I did textual studies, um, that was uh, the uh, poem that I chose um, as my essay for my essay. So I was oh, just good. looking at the, you know, the difference in quarto uh, version of it, and uh, so there was how the, the the lines were, you know, when it was printed, how one of the words would be off. Uh, uh, the measurer who it was rather about measuring these words uh, to get it into the quarto size and uh, so I found that very interesting and yes it, it is a very beautiful poem. I mean you read Venus and Donis now and you, you I mean I you, one understands easily why it was so popular in Shakespeare's yeah. time. Yeah. Yes. Um, there was actually uh, there is a query posted in the chat Yes, thank you. So Martin, wow. this was on the earlier part where we were talking about biological age. So he's uh, My, very, oh. isn't it more about feeling old rather than about the chronological or the biological age? This was with reference to the earlier. Who, so, who has, can we read out the 
Mr. Martin Wiggins has. Oh, that is Dr. Martin Wiggins. We have Martin with us. Well, Martin's comment is very helpful to our purposes. Thank you, Martin. Isn't it about feeling old rather than being chronologically and biologically old? That's Martin. that's Martin. Martin has made that comment in uh, chat uh, about Sonny Hunter. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, certainly says he is. <laughs> and uh, Michael Dobson says Nikki Watson and I credited as research assistants on that book. Which uh, which 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 book would that? Oh, I can't ask now. I can ask. It's I, probably... Uh, which book were we referring to? Uh, this was uh, at 153. Garber, I guess. Oh, right. Was that Marjorie's book? Yes. Marjorie's on... But yeah, thank you. Vice versa. Yeah. We, Michael, we ha I had not noticed you and Nikki in the credits, but um, I, shall, I shall go back and uh, put a little asterisk. The young Michael. <laughs> yes. Um, OK. Um, shall we go to the next question? Uh, so, um, in the in the introduction of the book, you write, um, you know, this this was something that I found interesting. And then um, there are lots of um, questions, anyhow, about you know Shakespeare and who published this and everything. So, when you write, do you particularly have to be extra cautious and you know, would for using on the surviving evidence, you know, to, to insert uh, these and also to say, for, for example, you say Shakespeare's seen on the surviving evidence to be a pioneer in broadening the stylistic range of drama by using sonnet form for spoken dialogue in the linguistic fabric of plays. Yeah, um, we're just trying to be, trying to be scholarly there uh, because an awful lot has got lost yes. from the period. Poems by Shakespeare might have got lost and certainly other works have, have, have got lost. Uh, many, many plays are known to have existed and don't survive. So we have to admit sometimes that the evidence is patchy and that, that, that if we had the complete corpus of what was written during this period, it would change our views. But we, 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 we were able to, complete, to consult the complete corpus in Martin Wiggins' head on this point, weren't we, Stanley? And Martin <laughs> yeah. was very helpful in, uh, in, in encouraging us to, uh, to understand more fully that Shakespeare seems to have been unique in the way he deployed um, sonnets within the dramatic dialogue. Yes for epilogues, yes for prologues. Um, uh, and Martin says the surviving corpus is not the complete corpus, of course, no, we, that, that's understood. So that therefore one has to qualify what one says. But we, you know, we, it's, it's very, well, to go back to what Empson said to Eubank, on such a subject of Shakespeare's sonnets, it's impossible to say anything either tidy or complete. One's got to be really careful with the language one yeah. uses when describing these very nuanced, sensitive poems, because, you know, you, you can sometimes just weigh in too heavily and be too generalised, and that, that's to the detriment of individual poems. So it, it, one's got to be really on one's best yeah. critical behaviour when one's addressing Shakespeare's sonnets, I think. Surely. So you, it, for Shakespeare, you have to be extra, extra careful and cautious when so. you're writing about Shakespeare. Yeah. Especially the sonnets, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, now, uh, these sonnets, uh, as you've already spoken in the introduction, cover a, a range of emotions and subjects that mainly adults uh, deal with. And so in education, at um, what age or what academic level would you recommend introducing these sonnets? How old were you, Stanley, when you came across Sonnet 29? I, well, it's so long ago, I can't actually remember. But I, I would say I'm probably about 15. But I, I would say that uh, they, they should be fed, drip-fed rather gradually. I, I think some of the sonnets, like number 18, for example, Shall I Compare Thee to Summer's Day, lyrical poems like that, are, are, are more suitable for younger readers or listeners than some of the others. Some, some you might prefer even to hide away from, from very young children. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, any, any ch child at a secondary school level uh, to read a complete collection, or, uh, unless they were very exceptional children. Uh, I, I think uh, a teacher needs to exercise great judgment in deciding which sonnets. Uh, and of course, some, some people just don't like poetry. You mustn't force feed 
uh, your pupils, I don't think, if, if, if things are to their distaste. If they don't like it, put them on to something else, I would say. What do you think, Paul? Well, I think there are various reasons why, uh, different reasons why one might try to introduce some sonnets more than others and keep some aside, because some of them won't read as easily and, and might put people off. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, if, if we're hiding poems... Uh, on moral grounds, the best thing to do is say, well, here are the easy ones and here are the ones you're not supposed to read, but I'm going to give them you anyway, you know. <laughs> I'm going to give them to you anyway because, you know, they're, they're, they're fun, you're going to get a lot from them, they're about adult themes and so on. Um, uh, but, it, it, you know, as Sandy said, poetry is not for everybody, but a sonnet is just small enough to encompass and it's a great challenge to... to and they, apparently sonnets were very popular during lockdown in the UK because they allowed people to have you know, little journeys uh, on their own, um, you know, for about a, a, a just over a minute or so, and you'd encompass a whole poem, and then you could read it back and meditate on it and think about it and read it to a friend and so on and talk about it. So there's a, there's they work on ma in many ways in terms of friendship and readership and self-discovery, these poems. And uh, I mean, I'm, I remember trying to make my way through the collection when I was about um, 16, perhaps, listening to an audio recording of John Gielgud reading them and, and clearly not understanding many of them, but, but, but you know, flashes of understanding uh, were occurring and I, and, I, and, I, and I felt I was very excited by that. So I, I kept reading Shakespeare's sonnets, yeah. Oh, I think you've gone on to mute. Oh. Sorry about that, uh, I didn't realize. Um, now, um, the subjects um, also are, are quite delicate and complex, that you also write that the readers could become uh, Shakespeare's private friends um, while reading these. And um, the, these sonnets, they, they do not sermonize, um, even when he's asking the young man to marry in order to have his bloodline continue. Um, you know, tell us a bit about uh, Shakespeare's um, moral philosophy, if you would. Goodness. Well, I think I think I'm not sure I'd call it moral philosophy myself. I'd, I'd call it self understanding, and and I think there's self deprecation there, and I think there's um, sometimes flashes of anger there. There's confession at work. There's self abasement. There's memory. There's a. Um, a a, a strong will to immortalize uh, the beloved, an endless fascination on um, uh, about the beloved, the, the beloved haunting Shakespeare's um, thoughts at night time, not being able to sleep. The, several of the poems are about sleeplessness. Um, there's a, an admiration for unconventional beauty um, in the sonnets, um, and and then there's the the one about his own soul. You know, so. Um, we can't construct a moral philosophy uh, based on Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, I think all I can do is look at these poems in relation to self-reflection, self-knowledge, uh, and how that might be articulated. Yeah, this, this relates them to Shakespeare the dramatist, doesn't it? Shakespeare is the least didactic of writers. He's not telling people what to think. He may be showing them how to think in some ways. Uh, he, he's giving them examples of, of, of how people think and of how they feel. But he's not trying to inculcate. I don't think he's trying to inculcate a moral philosophy. I don't, th I don't think he had a moral philosophy. Um, it's, it's I mean, but some of the sonnets, of course, are little essays, which is quite different, whereby he sets up a proposition and takes it to a conclusion. And, and, uh, and you know, that, that's, that's a, a different kind of um, way of understanding this kind of working through, isn't you, it? This is Keats, Keats territory, isn't it? Can you... What, what does Keats well, negative say? Capability. Negative capability. Keats, Keats in his letters has some marvellous passages about Shakespeare uh, uh, in which he stresses the fact that Shakespeare... He, he talks about the, the, poetic personality having, the poet having no personality, allowing the, 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 allowing the feelings to come through, the emotions to come through, un, un, untrammeled by, by moral philosophy. So I, I think uh, Shakespeare is the, is the great exponent of almost anti-philosophy. Sorry, I, I, I haven't thought this through, but 
I don't think Shakespeare's ever a didactic writer. He's not, try, not trying to teach lessons. He's if, trying to show us how to feel. If, if you want just a single example of, a, as it were, a little essay like sonnet, then um, 27 about sleeplessness um, is, you know, is quite a good example of that. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed. The dear repose for limbs with travail tired. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's work's expired. For then my thoughts, from far where I abide, intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids open wide, looking on darkness which the blind do see, save that my soul's imaginary sight presents thy shadow to my sightless view, which, like a jewel hung in ghastly night, makes black night beauteous and her old face new. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind, for thee and for myself no quiet find. Here's my problem, here's what it feels like, here's what I'm trying to do about it, can't escape it, and here's the conclusion. And one, one follows that through very clearly, I think, in the sonnet that I've just read, sonnet, but there, there's several like that. Um, uh, this is also quite current and in discussion, so I, I thought I should ask this. What can we learn about race and gender from, from these sonnets? Well, um, gender, <clears throat> are, in, in a way, our edition points to gender throughout because of our consistent identification of the gender of the addressee whether that can be determined or not. Um, perhaps the most famous sonnet about gender is Sonnet 20, when Shakespeare writes about the master mistress of my passion, mm. which is a very flirtatious sonnet, it's a very bisexual sonnet, and um, it's a sonnet which speaks, seems to speak directly to our own times and the way we have discourses on, um, on transgender, and queerness and so on and that sonnet I've heard discussed quite a lot recently um, in in very compelling very interesting ways um, uh, in relation to to modern discourses of gender in terms of race well one of the papers I'm looking at for next week's seminar at the Shakespeare Association of America um, is it, it take racializes um, uh, uh, one of the sonnets 77 in fact because um, there's a phrase waste blanks and in Q 1609 it's waste blacks and the the writer of this um, paper racializes that term and, and has a discussion of race the dark lady herself mm. um, the phrase um, is it uh, has been racialized um, we can look at sonnet 127 in the old age black was not counted fair you know they, they become fringed um, and uh, uh, fascinating uh, in relation to uh, modern discourses of race. Yes, Margaret de Grazia has written, hasn't she, about about this, about the possibility that the dark lady, so-called dark lady, was actually a black woman. Uh, that the, the, the Shakespeare knew that the black may not be purely metaphorical or, or, or imaginative here, but these things are indeter indeterminable. I'm afraid, finally. We don't know what Shakespeare. We don't know who Shakespeare was was writing about, but we may guess. Um, yes, uh, thank you for that. And al although this last question is outside of the purview of uh, sonnets, um, when we have um, you here, we have to ask you this: um, Shakespeare and education. Um, so in India, decolonizing English teaching in India has seen a departure of many English writers from the present day curriculum to a great extent, uh, Shakespeare being one. And um, how do you view this? Um, how much of Shakespeare's too much or too less at um, undergraduate and or postgraduate level studies? Well, I, I think it depends why you're teaching literature, isn't it? And I think that's one of the ways of answering this question. And it might be that we need more anthologies. It might be that we need more anthologies of, of different writers over time grouped in, into different themes 
and, and different political agenda across those, uh, across, across those anthologies. Um, my hope is that Shakespeare will still be among some of the greatest writers within those anthologies, um, as uh, uh, you know, among writers from other nationalities as well. It depends whether you translate or not, and what translation does to Shakespeare into the receiving language. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a, a you know a, a big question to to unpack and think about. What What do you think, Stanley? Um, I agree with you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I mean, literature courses are taught for a variety of purposes, aren't they? And um, it, it depends what 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 subjects you want to study. I mean, you know, if, if you're, for example, if you're studying fantasy literature, does that mean that you're going to go to different world literatures and produce the very best uh, over how long a period? So there are canons within canons. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the teacher or the people who decide what is to be taught shouldn't be overawed by uh, Western reputations shouldn't feel that just because everybody says Shakespeare is the greatest writer, uh, he, he, he alone can be taught. He should, he should be set aside. Other writers of different complexions in every sense of the word, dif different uh, racial and also different intellectual uh, standards. Um, I, did, I had the, the great privilege of um, uh, recording a podcast with Professor um, Sukanta Chaudhary, about, specifically about his wonderful edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream for the Arden Shakespeare. Um, and if listeners or uh, any of your people would like to find that, if you go to the website of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, shakespeare.org.uk, um, you can hear conversations uh, which touch on some of these themes in that podcast with... Um, Professor Chaudhary. May I perhaps also point out that if they go to the same website, they'll find four lectures on Shakespeare. By, by me, one of which is called What Do the Sonnets Tell Us About Shakespeare? That's true. <laughs> so if you look up what was Shakespeare really like, and you'll hear Stanley's four lectures that he gave on the occasion of his 90th birthday. Um, and one of them is. Many what, years ago. Uh, and one of them is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, Thank you for answering all these questions. Um, I pass this on to Lakshmi. Thank you, Lakshmi. And so Stanley, Dr. Paul, that was such an exhilarating, intriguing, mystifying, inspiring, and enlightening session. There were so many aha moments in what you told us. We congratulate you on your completing your first year and hope you have many more successful years to come. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to speak. I mean, it's just been such a pleasure and a, 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 I feel really privileged to have been part of this anniversary celebration. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation and taking the time out for us. Right. Um, um, yes. Um, We've just put together a small audiovisual presentation for all of you, our esteemed guests. And uh, Lakshmi has actually put a lot of effort, a heart and soul into it. It kind of showcases what Paul has been doing. Lakshmi, over to you. Sounds create words. Words make images and meanings. Images and meanings affect emotions. Emotions make us who we are. What a gross injustice was done to the lyrical wealth that we were blessed with. Are the present attitudes in education catastrophic? But they don't seem to realize how much of an effort is required to make a change for the sake of future generations. And what might the remedial solution be? If I get the chance to be a part of the system, I will change this one thing that they, they should add uh, sports and adventure activities uh, in a school curriculum. In whose hands are our children's future safe? The minute you learn from nature, you realize how limited the mechanistic Cartesian teaching is. Can 
end, the reversal of the educational degradation begins here and now with O. We just wanted to unveil uh, our next um, series. Thank you very much. Um, and um, so I just want to thank, we have a lot of thanking to do. First of all, a big thank you, Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paul Edmondson for accepting our invitation and for this very informing and scholarly lecture and um, for answering all the questions that we had for you. Um, and um, now we couldn't have turned uh, one without the support and encouragement of all of you. And I think I'm drawing a blank here uh, when I, you know, to thank everyone. Um, so we are a trust and therefore our resources, at least in our first year, are our volunteers who have selflessly helped us with all our needs thus far. We thank our patrons who helped us with uh, donations even before we looked to seek for funding. Um, more than the financial support, it was a moment of great joy for all of us uh, to realize that our work matters um, enough to earn your trust. Um, I also take this opportunity to thank everyone in our team. Um, you know, just uh, if, if I'm forgetting any names, you, you can deal with me later. Um, I wanna thank Ajat, uh, Shatru Singh, our tech head, uh, creative director, um, 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 Errol uh, Rodrigues, um, Meg Hassan there, our uh, finance officer, Mike, our liaison officer, uh, Vishnu, uh, head graphic design, uh, Smith, who's a consultant for sound design, and um, uh, Oz, um, very, very dear and supportive friends uh, who helped us realize this dream. Abhay Sopori, uh, Appu Bhattatiri, uh, Professor uh, Chandrakant Raju, uh, Firoz Khan, Nilanjana Banerjee, uh, Prince Rama Verma, um, uh, Ranjit Marar, Renel Snellex, uh, Sachin Chaudhary, uh, Lakshmi Kumaran, who was hosting this for us, um, Lakshmi Kamal, uh, Sarah Jacob, um, Sheetal Mahajan, Vandana Shiva. And, um, um, and finally, our um, wonderful trustees who played a key role in inspiring to set up our organization. Uh, Puran Chandra Pandey, he, he is a mentor uh, uh, to me and a sounding board whenever I have found myself lost and very, very, very anxious. Um, Venkatesh Ramakrishnan for being eternally positive. And to me, he's a magician who can make things happen. Uh, Shivraj Prashad, my very beloved friend who's always up for an adventure. And uh, this is a great ride. I hope you, you are enjoying this as well, Shivraj. Um, and um, Ragini um, is O's treasurer and I think my treasure, my sounding board uh, and uh, who answers my calls at any hour of the day and night. Um, and Alan Kalikal, the youngest of our trustees who's attention to detail has saved us from many embarrassing errors. And I'm really delighted to have uh, had um, um, a, the support of Shakespeare Institute, um, Michael Dobson and um, uh, also Martin Wiggins for, you know, being here and, uh, you know, cheering with us. And this is, I'm extremely, extremely grateful and thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.